Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the University of Wisconsin, Marathon County for tonight's forum, Lessons Learned from Iraq, Where Do We Go From Here? We'd like to thank you for being here tonight. My name is Eric Giordano and I'm a, an assistant professor of political science at UWMC. I will serve as the host and moderator for tonight's forum. This forum was made possible by generous support from the Hermaning Financial Group and we're grateful that Kevin Hermaning, the president uh, of this group, is here with us in the audience tonight. Thank you very much, Kevin. And also, um, the, this forum is sponsored by Clay Norbum, a former student at UWMC, and a representative from uh, the family. Dr. Corey Norbum is here, also, I believe, with her sister-in-law. Is that correct? Sister, Sister sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for your generous support. Uh, the forum is also sponsored by the UWMC Foundation. And because of the generous contributions of these sponsors, we're pleased to announce that tonight's forum will be the first installment of an annual Global Issues Forum, which will be presented at UWMC in the years to come on a variety of global topics. <clears throat> we would also like to thank UWMC Dean Jim Veninga for his vision and leadership in suggesting the creation of the Global Issues Forum. And tonight's forum, of course, would not be possible without the hard work of our Lecture in Fine Arts Coordinator, Gene Greenwood, our Public Relations Director, Judy Whitkoff, our Theater Technician, Chris Berg, and of course, our incredible student ambassadors. The objective tonight is to create an open, honest conversation about lessons learned from the United States military presence in Iraq. This is not a forum on the correctness or justness of the war in Iraq nor are we specifically seeking to debate an appropriate conclusion or exit from the war, though this certainly is an issue that is bound to arise in our conversation. Instead, we have invited three practitioners, professionals and experts in their respective fields with ample qualifications to help us understand what America has or has not learned from this experience. As a nation, it is likely that we will debate far into the future the wisdom of this venture, the lessons learned. But for many people, American soldiers and Marines, Iraqi security forces, and millions of civilians caught in the middle of this uh, tragic conflict, we cannot wait to begin trying to find answers. We need to understand right now, this moment, as best we can, how to limit or avoid future tragedy. I'd like to introduce our presenters. First, we will hear from, we changed the order up a little bit, Colonel Thomas Greenwood from the United States Marine Corps, who's the director of the Command and Staff College of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. Colonel Greenwood entered the Marine Corps in 1976. By the mid-1990s, Colonel Greenwood was serving as operations officer for Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force Caribbean which participated in Operation Support Democracy and Uphold Democracy in Haiti. In January 1996, he assumed command of the 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines. In this capacity, he participated in Operations Guardian Retrieval, Silver Wake, and Noble Obelisk in Zaire, Albania, and Sierra Leone, respectively, the latter of which I gather was a bit hairy at times. In June 1998, he was selected to top-level school to attend top-level school at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. In April of 1999, he reported to Washington, D.C., where he served as an aide to the Commandant of the Marine Corps before being reassigned to the National Security Council. In July of 2003, Colonel Greenwood assumed command of the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit at Camp Pendleton, California. During this tour, he participated in combat operations in South Baghdad in support of the 3rd Infantry Division as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. In July of 2005, Colonel Greenwood was reassigned to the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force command element as the G-10, or the Assistant Chief of Staff, for developing Iraqi security forces. In this billet, he was responsible for supervising the manning, training, and equipping of more than 40 Operation Iraqi Freedom advisor teams. In February of 2006, he deployed to Iraq again, where he helped advisor teams develop Iraqi Army, police, and border forces. We're grateful to have Colonel Greenwood here tonight. Our next speaker will be Colonel Christopher Holshek. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Colonel Christopher Holshek is a civil affairs colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve. He has extensive civil military operations experience at the strategic, operational, and tactical levels through a number of assignments and deployments. Among them, command of the 1st uh, Civil Affairs Battalion to deploy in Iraq in support of Army, Marine, and British forces. He also served as a civil military liaison officer to the United Nations Interim Mission in Kosovo and participated in the planning and deployment of civil affairs forces to the Balkans. As a consultant, currently associated with Dynacor International, the Institute for Defense Analysis, and the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Civil Military Relations, he specializes in civil military and interagency stability and peace operations, information operations, and interdisciplinary training and education. A 2006 graduate of the U.S. Army War College and an adjunct faculty member of George Mason University, he has written extensively on these subjects. In brief, he is an expert in what we might call winning hearts and minds. That portion of military work that is designed to build and strengthen societies before, during, and after traditional combat operations. He has been interviewed by national publications about the war from the Washington Post and most recently in Thomas Rick's new book, Fiasco, if you've had a chance to take a look at that. He is gaining reputation as a deep thinker on military issues and has challenged the status quo with ideas on how to restructure the military to better accomplish its tasks. Thank you for being here, Colonel. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Pauline Baker. Dr. Baker is the president of the Fund for Peace and a, a professorial lecturer at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, also known as SICE. In 10 years, she has transformed the Fund for Peace, a Washington-based nonprofit organization, into a dynamic player in the area of conflict and security issues. Her organization tracks daily indicators of stability in various states around the world using a sophisticated events data methodology known as Conflict Assessment System Tool. It is a patent approved model that has been used in many applications, including to help create the first annual Failed States Index, which was published recently in, form, in the Foreign Policy Journal. The information gathered by the Fund for Peace is used by government agencies, universities, and think tanks for policy making and research. The Fund for Peace makes significant contributions to the foreign policy making world, to national security professionals in and out of uniform, and to academics. The group's six months reports are must-read material for anyone who is serious about understanding what is happening in Iraq and elsewhere around the world. And a special thanks tonight to Chris and Pauline, who took an aerial tour of the Midwest as they flew in and out of various airports trying to avoid the weather. We're very grateful that they made it tonight, and we thank you so much for being here. Each of our presenters will take approximately 15 minutes to share their views with us. After their presentations, we will move to a question and answer period. I will ask the first question, after which I will invite members of the audience, and each of you will be free to ask questions directed to one or all of our panelists. UWMC ambassadors will circulate through the theater with microphones. One question per person, please. Uh, comments from the audience will be limited to one minute each. We ask that you accord our guests and each other the courtesy and respect that we all expect from a public forum dedicated to civic dialogue. At this time, we'd like to ask you to make sure that your cell phones and pagers are turned off. And our forum will end promptly at 9 o'clock p.m. After the forum, we will have a short reception with some cookies and drink in the terrace room. And that is the room as you exit the theater to the right, straight ahead. So we welcome everyone, and we thank our guests. And we'll begin with Colonel Tom Greenwood. Well, thank you. thank you, Doctor. Can everybody hear? OK. Thank you, Doctor, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to be able to participate in your panel this evening, and I thank you for the invitation to do so. Um, I must caveat my appearance up front by saying that my views tonight are my own, and I'm not speaking for the Marine Corps or the Department of Defense. As uh, the doctor mentioned in the introductions, I just returned from Iraq in August of 2006 after being in charge of U.S. advisor teams stationed mainly in Al-Anbar province, but with a few teams also around Baghdad. These teams, both Marine and Army, lived with the Iraqi Security Forces, or the ISF, which includes the Iraqi Army, the Iraqi Police, and the Iraqi Border Forces. The advisor team mission was to train the Iraqi Security Forces to be able to provide for their own security. 
For some of you who may not be familiar with Iraq's geography, Al Anbar is to the west of Baghdad and extends out to the Syrian, Jordanian, and down south to the Saudi borders. It's a large area, 53,000 square miles, uh, and one of the 18 provinces in Iraq, and it's also sometimes referred to as the Sunni Triangle. There's a good article today in the USA Today uh, about uh, the Al, Al Anbar, and I commend it to you. Uh, the year before, in 2005, I commanded a 2,000 man Marine Expeditionary Unit that fought insurgents in South Baghdad. So I have had two rather different experiences in Iraq that, that have shaped my ideas. Uh, all that said, I want to emphatically state that none of this makes me an expert on Iraq or the Middle East. Um, Nonetheless, I'm pleased to be able to share some of my views with you this evening, and I look forward to having a good exchange of ideas with you. Uh, I'm going to talk about maybe three or four major lessons that, that I think are important from the Iraqi war. And, and some of these are not necessarily at the tactical level, so I would encourage you, if you're interested, in asking those kinds of questions during the Q&A. The first lesson that, that I think is very important that we take away from the Iraq war is, is the, the necessity to understand the nature of the war that we're getting involved in before we go to war, and perhaps even more importantly, how wars evolve after they get started. And I'm going to concentrate on the second half of that of that statement there. In other words, the war we face today in Iraq is not the war that we had in 2003. It's, it's instead of a simple insurgency uh, that we faced in 2003 and 2004, we now face a complex insurgency, or what some experts call a hydra-headed hydra insurgency that has been overlaid with a low-level civil war that is getting worse, not better. In other words, Iraq, Iraq today is not about a bunch of disgruntled Sunnis supported by foreign fighters who are attacking U.S. coalition forces and the Shia-dominated Iraqi army in order to make foreigners, U.S. and coalition forces go home or to undermine the new democratically elected government of Iraq. Yes, all of those things are going on, for sure. But all of that now has been superseded largely superseded by Sunnis attacking Shias and Shias attacking Sunnis, vice versa, with increased frequency and intensity as part of growing sectarian violence or what many of us call ethnic cleansing. And this sectarian violence of Shia versus Sunni and vice versa has produced a murder and intimidation campaign which is intended by extremists in various camps that I'll talk about here in just a minute it's intended front by these extremists to make political compromise appear unachievable. This dynamic, and that's, that's the way to understand it is, this is a dynamic that causes a self-perpetuating cycle of violence. And it begins with the Sunni insurgency, but it's exploited by Al-Qaeda and other foreign fighters who want to fuel that sectarian fear and violence between the Shias and the Sunnis. This then rationalizes the need for Shia militias who then go out and whose existence and vigilante behavior undermines the creation and legitimacy of the Iraqi army that we're working so hard to build. Those militias then further feed Sunni fears, which then fuels the resistance and the insurgency. And so this cycle continues. It's layered. It's a layered cycle of violence. It's interconnected, and it's intractable. And it's a wicked problem, given the number of second and third order groups, rival groups, that exist within these three big, big camps, the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds. For example, within the Sunni camp, we have nationalists, we have ex-Bathists, we have former military, and we have angry Sunni young men. In the terrorist camp, there are jihadists, there's foreign fighters, and there's al-Qaeda. And in the Shia camp, you have those who support Muqtada Sadr and his jam militia. You have those who belong to the Badr Corps, 
and then you have Shia moderates who are trying to make the new Iraqi government work. Then you have the Kurds. You have those who support the KDP and those who support the PUK. And then there's extensive criminal elements across all of that. And by my math, this is at least 13 different sets of actors, 13 different sets of major actors, all with competing agendas. But interestingly enough, they're remarkably cooperative when it serves their interest. And if this isn't complex enough, then we should consider the following, that after years of oppression under Saddam Hussein, the Shia, who are now the dominant political ruling class in Iraq, they have little sympathy for the Sunni, and they have almost no desire to be inclusive or magnanimous toward their former enemy. And for their part, the Sunnis refuse to acknowledge their defeat. They refuse to accept that they're the new, minor that they're new minority status and they remain wedded to reclaiming their former status of power or power status which they enjoyed under Saddam Hussein back before 2003, regardless of how, how absurd the new demographics and the new political order makes these aspirations. From the Sunni perspective, the, the new Iraqi army that we're building looks like a Shia and Kurdish militia that's armed with better weapons. So all of this is a witch's brew, and it doesn't bode well for the future. But the real lesson here is that it is critical that when nations go to war, they truly understand kind of what they're getting into, and most importantly, they understand that once they get involved in those wars, the enemy is going to adapt and change in, in unforeseen ways, as we have seen here in, in Iraq. The second lesson that I, that I think we've learned in Iraq is that all progress in an insurgency and a low-level civil war, past, present, and future, is contingent on three factors, security, security, and security. Until the Iraqi people feel secure, it will be virtually impossible to gain traction in the other areas of governance, reconstruction, economic development, building a credible police force, establishing competent and honest civil service, within the ministries of government, stemming the uh, middle class brain drain, providing social services, attracting foreign investment, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the new Iraqi government, like governments everywhere, will not be viewed as credible and legitimate in the eyes of the Iraqi people until it can get a monopoly on the use of coercive force. And currently this process, as you all know from reading the papers and watching television, is not going very well. Death squads and militias continue to flourish, and the people, the Iraqi people's trust and confidence in their central government continues to erode. So lack of security remains, in, in my view, uh, the number one problem in Iraq. But the key, the key point here is that all the other good things that we're trying to have happen in terms of underwriting the success of the Iraqi government, all those other important facets of, of governance, uh, can't occur until the security situation stabilizes us. At this point, we should probably be asking ourselves why after three years U.S. coalition forces have not been able to decisively tip the security balance in favor of the Iraqi government. And I think the answer is we have had too few U.S. coalition forces to be able to effectively execute our strategy of clear, hold, and build. As U.S. forces are moved around Iraq to meet new emerging threats, we uncover areas that we have secured and we create vacuums, which further invites the enemy to go in and reestablish their presence, which leads to renewed violence, misery, and diminished hopes on the part of the local populace. Until the situation is rectified, the civil war will continue to grow, and stability and security will continue to be elusive. And this is recognized by the senior leadership of, of our country. And in those of you that watched uh, the commander of Central Command testify on Capitol Hill yesterday, he, he responded to a question uh, by, by one of the committee members of, do we have enough forces in Iraq? And General Abizade said, no, we do not. And when asked the question, do we need to increase U.S. forces there, he said, no, we do not, but we do need to increase Iraqi forces. So there's recognition that whether it's U.S. coalition or Iraqi forces, um, we, we don't have enough to handle the security situation. Now, it remains to be seen whether the strategy of clear, hold, and build 
is going to remain what our future strategy here in the wake of the election and, and the Baker Hamilton Committee uh, report that's due out here in the near future. Near future. The next uh, lesson I think we have learned from Iraq is the difficulty of establishing democracy in other parts of the world. While the U.S. invasion of Iraq focused on toppling a dictator and ushering in democracy, it has fundamentally altered the balance of power in the Middle East by fostering a Shia revival in Iraq that has emboldened Iran and encouraged the rise of Shiism throughout the region. I think we're just now beginning to comprehend the consequences of this realignment. In large measure, I think this reveals some of our cultural naivety. But on this issue, I commend you a very fine book by Professor Vali Nasser of the Naval Postgraduate School entitled The Shia Revival and How Conflict Within Islam Will Shape the Future. And in one passage of the book, Nasser writes, and I quote, it is clear today that America cannot take comfort in an imagined future for the Middle East and cannot force the realization of that future. Such an approach guided the path to war in Iraq and has proven unworkable. The lesson of Iraq is that trying to force a future of the, its liking will hasten the advent of those outcomes that the United States most wishes to avoid. Through occupation of Iraq, America has actually made the case for radical Islam that ours is a war on Islam and encouraged anti-Americanism and fueled extremism and terrorism. The reality that will shape the future of the Middle East is not the debate over democracy or globalization that the Iraq war was supposed to have jump-started, but the conflicts between the Shia and the Sunni that it precipitated. In time, we will come to see this as the central legacy of the Iraq war." End quote. Now, whether you or I agree with Nasser is not the point, although I tend to think that the last part of his quote is probably right. Instead, I believe quite emphatically that most Americans don't think the war, they do not think that a war against all of Islam is necessary to defeating terrorism and winning the long war. And I have practicing Muslim friends who have found a way to balance their faith with modernity. And in my view, they're the hope of the future and not the enemy. And I think we should be careful not to create demons where they don't exist. Over time, the moral bankruptcy of radical Islam that espouses violence and religious intolerance will be exposed for what it is. As Nasser himself writes later in the book, he says, quote, the Shia revival constitutes the most powerful resistance and challenge to Sunni extremism and jihad activism within the region. Its objectives are served by change in the regional balance of power and democracy, and in turn, democracy will unleash the full extent of the Shia challenge to Sunni extremism. Eventually, most Shias and Sunnis will look for ways to reach a state of peace, to live together, and share political goals and aspirations. Democracy will be far more efficient than dictatorship at attaining that goal." End quote. So at the end of this transition phase that Nasser thinks we're in, in the Middle East right now, that was largely unleashed by our war in Iraq, uh, he is optimistic that there will be a better world in that part of the, world, that part of the, of the globe. Lastly, uh, I think there's some lessons here for all of us uh, that Iraq instructs us uh, to think about security matters through a new prism. Um, and I have just a couple of these I want to briefly mention. The first one is that Winning and losing, the terms winning and losing, may no longer be useful terms for discussing today's conflicts that are less about the clash of nations and conventional armies and more about asymmetrical warfare, terrorists, and, and other smaller groups um, operating in the shadows. Per perhaps we should talk about desired outcomes, those strategies which allow us to best shape and maximum the outcomes favorable to our national interest, as well as achieving regional peace and stability. Next, it's probably useful that we think hard about the differences between stability and democracy, recognizing that the Saddam Husseins of the world may not always be accidents of fate, but may be the products of their own cultures. And we probably should understand when trade-offs are required between stability and democracy and not be naive or short-sighted about either. 
And next, we should probably recognize that if we want to be a transformational global power, we probably need to get proficient at nation building. And if we can't overcome our national aversion to doing this, to creating a capacity to do nation building on a large scale before we put our young men and women in harm's way, then maybe we should temper our war aims. And finally, I think one of the things that we have learned out of this conflict is that diplomacy should not be viewed as a reward for good behavior. Rather, it's a fundamental activity that occurs within and between the community of nations, especially those who you perceive as hostile to your interests. Because if you don't talk to your enemies, how can you convert them or find areas of mutual interest before the bullets start flying? Those are just some of the broad lessons learned that, that I think uh, Iraq impressed upon me after two tours over there. Again, those are fairly, fairly, uh, fairly broad, and I'm happy to, to talk about more specific operational or tactical issues during the question and answer period. But um, uh, I've enjoyed my time, and uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Rio. We'll save the applause to the end of um, the forum. We'll now turn to Colonel Christopher Holshek. Thanks, Eric. Okay, as they say, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, Tom, those were really great remarks, and, it, and, and it's uh, uh, serendipity is a wonderful thing because a lot of what I'm going to say is going to build on what you said, uh, and hopefully then provide the uh, another foundation for uh, what Pauline's going to say. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my remarks in the uh, spirit of the Parisian dressmaker, long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to keep it interesting. <laughs> what I'm going to do is take, pick up on an, on an idea that Tom delivered about a guy named Karl von Clausewitz, who said, among many of his famous dictums, is that the first order of business when you go to war is to understand the type of war you're in. Uh, I'm going to take that idea that, that Tom posited operationally and apply that on a much more strategic level. Sorry, I'm a recent graduate of the War College. I've got to show off my strategic skills. And um, the way I'm going to look at this is, you know, I'm thinking here about a famous Green Bay Packers coach who once said on the sidelines, what the hell is going on here? And I want to look at this issue within the context of 21st, national secure, 21st century national security and how are we approaching that whole business. And Going again back to Clausewitz, the, you know, you have to understand the environment. That's one part of it. Uh, I think that's the, w there are two major imperatives, if you will, that are driving and shaping our, the way we are going to be doing business uh, in the short or longer term in the 21st century for some time, and the first is, is that strategic environment, and Tom alluded to that when he talked about asymmetric warfare. <clears throat> and what does that really mean? Well, that basically is simply saying, I'm not going to attack the, the, my enemy at his strengths, I'm going to attack him at his weaknesses. 9-11 uh, was a perfect example of asymmetric warfare. When you think about uh, an operation that costs less than $5 million, probably causing well over a trillion dollars worth of damage. That's, asymm that's asymmetry. Uh, you, you know, thinking outside the box is a, is a term we often like to, to use. But really, when you're trying to kind of figure out the rubric of 21st century national security strategy, you're, you've got to understand the box. It's not looking outside the box, it's understanding the box. And the two parts that I think that are, that are affecting this box, one it is this notion of warfare or conflict or competition being essentially different than we were used to in 
an era when, it, when we had essentially nation states competing with each other, when we went to war and you had regular forces against regular forces, you know, and in the Cold War, uh, you know, you had the calculations of how many tanks have you got on your side of the border and all these other things. Um, this environment that we are now in, the threats to national security, first of all, the concept of national security has been transcended specifically for the United States because it isn't something that just happens over there. Okay, that's the first big sea change. The second is that it emanates from places other than those we expect the threats to come from. They emanate largely from the civil sector and they emanate largely from the seams between nation states, non-state actors, super empowered individuals, terrorist groups that, like Al-Qaeda that don't have a sponsoring state, so to speak. Now they may have states that are friendly to them or or, or tolerate there, but you get the picture. The majority of those threats are, can be understood in those terms, and they are largely asymmetric in that respect. Asymmetric warfare, uh, as discussed in a recent uh, uh, paper by the um, Institute of Land Warfare in uh, Arlington, Virginia, is seen as population-centric. The population is ultimately the key to victory for both sides of the conflict. And, you know, for those of you who did read uh, the book in which I'm, I'm featured, that was the, one of the main questions when I challenged an army commander is to ask him, sir, what is the battle space? Is it physical or is it psychological? The battle space in both the tactical and the strategic sense is largely psychological. Difficult to measure, difficult to see, difficult to understand in a 30 second sound bite, which is what we're used to. So the way we view this environment where national security threats are gener largely generating, we have to kind of rethink that. But it's not, the good news, however, is not that just these, the threats are emanating, but also the opportunities for national security strategy. What I'm talking about here is things like the, you know, the so-called interagency process, non-governmental organizations, international organizations, and, and so on and so on. And the private sector, you know, multinational corporations and the like, they are also non-state actors. And more and more influence is being garnered through these types of organizations in the international landscape and not just nation states. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to declare the death of the nation state. I'm not saying that, but, but it's a, as Tom certainly very well described on an operational level, at the strategic level, it's also a far more complicated landscape. And it's understanding that environment. That's really changing the nature of things. We have a flattening 24-7 information-driven media cycle world. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that decision cycles shrink as these interdependent second and third order effects that we often like to talk about grow, pressuring leadership to anticipate change and shape events rather than be shaped by them. So we have to think more preventatively than reactively. Quite simply, the margins of error are simply becoming too narrow, the consequences and stakes too high, and the opportunities too great to keep doing the business of national security as usual. That's the one thing that's driving the scene. The other thing is, is, is probably less known by us, but I think it will be in very short order. And that is the erosion of our longstanding diplomatic, cultural, military, and economic advantages, at least in relative terms, which is also shrinking this margin of error 
and restraining American options and interdependence. I would be so bold to say that the whole idea of unilateralism is going to go by the wayside. We just haven't realized it. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that Iraq is certainly teaching us is, is that go, this idea of going in it alone or you know, among a coalition of willing uh, is probably not such a good thing. Uh, because beyond missed opportunities for a more effective way of dealing with these issues, um, the, the, it presents, what this presents is, is, if you will, our, our strategic culture is largely predicated on what could be called hard power. That's coercive power. That's the, the, the largely found in the military, but also used economically with sanctions and, 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 and withholding diplomacy for good behavior. That's coercion. There's a whole other realm of power out there, which some of you may have read about. It's called soft power. It's existed for a, you know, a long time. It's just been key, uh, coined in this way by a, a political scientist by the name of Joseph Nye. And that's the power to persuade. It's kind of the, the carrot versus the stick. And we wield as a nation a great deal and still have a great deal of soft power. We've eroded quite a bit of it because of the use of hard power. But I would tell you that there's some promise with respect to that uh, because if you, if you were to take a look at um, some of the polls being uh, done or, or monitored by a, uh, an association called Terror Free Tomorrow, um, they've shown, for example, that the military-led humanitarian efforts, uh, such as tsunami relief in Indonesia, earthquake relief in Pakistan, uh, and other such activities, have garnered much more favorable public opinion in these Muslim countries towards the U.S. Uh, so there's, there's certainly a lot of, of evidence to show that a balance in our approach to national security between hard and soft power um, can be very, very effective. In other words, what I'm saying here is these two strategic imperatives are driving the need for us to do a better job of integrating all of the elements of national power and not just simply going to the reflex response, which is, you know, when you think about it, you get the CNN moment and you're watching the starving kids in Darfur, Sudan, for example. What do we think about? Send in the Marines. We don't think about send in a, send an advanced civil team of, of, or a disaster assistance resp response team from the United States Information uh, Agency for National Development or send in a civil affairs team. You send, say send in the Marines because it's action. It's, it's, the, you know, it's what we're used to. And I would dare say that we're approaching very rapidly a period where we can no longer afford our strategic culture. You think about debt, private debt, public debt, corporate debt, personal debt. Uh, you think about our competitiveness in the world is, is diminishing. We have basically turned to hard power, and I would say that since the Civil War, because we've approached national security issues largely through the applic and, and been largely successful because of material and technological superiority. We get frustrated in wars like this and in like, like places like Vietnam, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to directly link the two of them, although there are some parallels, because it frustrates our attempt to use that strength that is our material and technological superiority. Okay, and this is what the asymmetric warfare business is about, is they under, our adversaries understand that and they're attacking us not at our strengths, they're attacking us in our weaknesses. Uh, we likewise need to understand what their center of gravity is, which is that, that whole hearts and minds thing. Something I don't think the Israelis really very well understood this summer in Lebanon. What the Hezbollah certainly did I mean, they went in right after, and so they had a phase four game plan, I'll tell you that. They went in right after, and they started, you know, with reconstruction projects and, and handing out money and getting families back on their feet, winning hearts and minds big time among the Lebanese people. 
So somebody out, under, out there understands what this business is about. We are getting better at this. There have been a lot of policies instituted lately, NSPD 44, uh, Department of Directive, Department of Defense Directive 3000.05, uh, the national security strategy itself, at the policy level, we've got a lot of examples of how we're beginning at the policy level to do a better job of integrating and, and applying all of the, of the elements of power at our disposal, both the soft, both the hard, the diplomatic, the information, military, economic, and so on. It just takes an amount of time, and for those of us who have lived in, and worked in Washington, we know that things there don't move at exactly a rapid pace sometimes. It takes an amount of time bef to, uh, before that is trickled down, if you will, from ends, ways, and means to the program and budgeting authorities and, and actually seeing that reflected on the ground. It takes a long time for institutional change, uh, but it is beginning to take take place. I think what, uh, in, 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 in an immediate sense, I'm concerned about with Iraq is that we may, we may either not learn the lessons uh, of, of Iraq, many of which, and for, for many of us who have been in this business, many of the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan are kind of like what Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again. Uh, stuff that we'd seen in the 1990s and even back in Vietnam. Um, my concern is that not only we don't learn the lessons, is maybe we learn the wrong lessons. And I think if we take a much broader appro approach to this and understand this at, within the broader context of national security, not just for the United States, but for all of our friends and allies in the world, and what kind of a world we want to have, then I think we'll manage to, to, to get to capture the right lessons in the right context. And with that, I'll end my remarks and turn it over to Pauline. Thank you, Colonel Holshek. Dr. Baker. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I feel a little intimidated here sitting between two strong and experienced and seasoned military experts. So I'm not going to try to compete with them. I'm going to give you a different uh, perspective. Uh, the Fund for Peace is an organization that about 10 years ago decided to shift its focus after the end of the Cold War to looking at small wars, ethnic conflicts, weak and failing states, that whole category of internal war, which before 9-11 we determined was that category of threats that would be most destabilizing in the world. It was quite clear even before 9-11 that most of the people in the world who were dying from wars civilians were dying in these sorts of internal wars that just erupted. They, their origins weren't uh, after the Cold War, but it erupted after the Cold War uh, in a major way. And uh, most of the staff, myself included, has had a lot of experience working in these kinds of countries. I myself lived in Africa for over a decade. I lived through the Nigerian Civil War. I shifted my focus to South Africa. I did an extensive amount of work in apartheid South Africa. So. I watched one country disintegrate, Nigeria, into civil war, and I watched another country pull itself back from the brink of a racial war. And uh, when I came, became president of the Fund for Peace, I decided that this was a genre of, of studies and research that we had far too little experience in. And as the United States began to deal with the Hades and the Bosnias of the world, it was quite clear we were doing it on an ad hoc basis. So that was the driving force and the motivation for our shifting our attention. And so our specialization now is the broad category of weak and failing states. Uh, how do we analyze them? How do we get our heads around them? And what do we do about it? Uh, our mission is to work to prevent war and alleviate the conditions that cause war. So this is a perfect match. One of the things, as Eric said, that we do is we create a failed state index. It's now an annual index. We've now rated. Uh, using a methodology that we have created and now patented uh, to rate 148 countries, the United States included, uh, on their vulnerability or risk of conflict. And uh, you may be surprised to know that in the 2006 failed state index, the United States did not come out 
in the category of the most stable. It came out stable, but not the most stable. Uh, and I can talk about that in the Q&A as to why that's true. We also applied this methodology to Iraq, and we did a series of reports that come out every six to eight months, which is on our website, and you can go see it, uh, using these 12 indicators, social, political, economic, military indicators, to really track what's going on from a social science point of view, uh, the 50,000 feet level. And we came up with something kind of interesting. I know you can't see it very well from where you are, but here is a trend line uh, of the three years, over the three years since the invasion. Actually, this first dot is the pre-war assessment going all the way through to October of this year. And a couple of things come out very clearly from this. One, and this is true for a lot of others, but we've actually documented it. When there is an intervention, whether it's the kind of intervention we did, whether you agree with it or not, or it's a UN mission, in a weak and failing state. You have maybe, Chris said six months, what we've looked at says more like three to four months, where there's a power vacuum, there's a new political force that comes in. If you don't get the fundamentals right in those three or four months, others will fill that power vacuum. And then you'll be dealing with a much more difficult problem. This happened in Iraq. Um, and the trend line showed that. Uh, things actually started to improve. High is bad, low is good. Things actually started to improve until President Bush declared an end to combat operations and we thought it's just a matter of holding an election, writing a constitution, and we get out of there. And then things started to go really bad. Second thing that we saw, we have, and again, you can't see this, I'm just using it as an illustration. We took that trend line and we, uh, looked at specific events to see if we could determine any patterns of why there were peaks and valleys in this. And we broke these 12 indicators down by each indicator so you can actually look at the specifics as well. And we found out something else interesting, and that is that at key points, when we thought we had reached a benchmark of progress, things started going bad. Why was that? It's because the things that we looked at that were benchmarks of project, uh, progress were seen by the Sunnis, particularly in the first year, as benchmarks of Shia ascendancy. Basically, this was empowering the Shia because they were the majority. So here we are coming in, democratizing, and the majority wins. Um, and the third thing that we established, and we were one of the first to come out and say it, it was not widely accepted at the time, is that Iraq was a failed state. In fact, we were surprised ourselves to learn that Iraq was a failing state even before we intervened. And what we did basically is pop the bubble. So picking up on Tom's and Chris's point, you have to understand your war and you have to understand your environment. Basically, no one did that kind of analysis before we went in to say, well, what is likely to happen? If you, if you overthrow, militarily overthrow a regime like Saddam Hussein's. We had this image of Iraq being a strong state. In our view, a strong state is not one which is dominated by a dictator uh, through terror. A strong state is one that has established institutions that operate under the rule of law and can solve its own problems, internal problems, peacefully without oppression and without an external military intervention. And as a result of Saddam Hussein's mismanagement, oppression, sanctions, basically for the last 10 years, Iraq was crumbling before our eyes. We just never saw it. We went in, I remember when we were talking about going in, the fourth largest army in the world, formidable enemy, so forth. The kind of language we used during the Cold War about the Soviet Union, which collapsed under its own weaknesses. So what essentially happened was that when we went in under the, with the objective of regime change, with the goal of replacing that regime with what we called a unified uh, multi-ethnic democracy, we actually went in and removed the only thing that was holding the country together, as awful as it was. It was basically a Yugoslavia. And just as Tito kept Yugoslavia together with a lot of repression and reward and patronage, that's the way 
uh, Saddam Hussein kept it together. He wasn't, uh, Tito wasn't quite as brutal as, as, uh, as Saddam Hussein. So what we were dealing with was not a war. We were dealing with a collapsed state. Now that is very profound. When you say you're dealing with a collapsed state, it means you really don't have control. A lot of people have done studies and compared a lot of operations and throw in Japan and Germany after World War II and show that that was, you know, we've done a lot of things there that were successful in nation building and so forth. The problem is post-war Japan and Germany were not collapsed states. They were conquered states. So when the Western forces went in, there was an established bureaucracy still there. Teachers were still in the schools. And of course, they were both homogeneous societies. They didn't have the pluralism that, that Iraq and a lot of other countries have. So it's not comparable. And in the same way, we are lumping together a lot of things and misnaming it. And I think that Tom was right in talking about language because language shapes concepts and concepts shapes understanding. So what are the, some of the lessons learned? Well, I would underscore what, what both my colleagues have said, better understanding and knowledge. And this is not just in the sense of better intelligence. Did, did, did Saddam Hussein have weapons of, of mass destruction or not? I mean a much deeper intelligence about the society we intend to reshape or whose regime we intend to overthrow. What is the nature of that and what are going to be the likely consequences of that action? Are they going to have the intended effect? Uh, yesterday, as, as Tom mentioned, um, General Abizad testified before Congress. And during his testimony, he came out with two lessons learned. Uh, one, he said there should have been more troops, as well as Iraqi and foreign forces, to stabilize the country immediately after the US-led invasion. Um, I think that's a pretty widely accepted view right now that when we did go in, at least operationally, that was one lesson learned, that if you're going to do it, you do it with the degree of resources that you really have. We've never, ever caught up. In fact, uh, as the security worsened, uh, we never had enough troops. I'm not sure enough troops is the answer now. It would have been the answer, or at least a good part of the answer, immediately after. Uh, I remember when the looting was going on and I was in a room with a lot of people and they said, oh, it's just a lot of people, you have to let them their freedom, you know, they're just venting. And I said, no, what you're seeing now is the literal collapse of the state and, and the undermining of the rule of law because the Iraqis did expect us to come in with a strong hand and establish the basis for the rule of law, but we stood back and let everything loot it. We did a lot of operational things that were pretty dumb too. We secured the oil wells but we didn't secure the munitions depots. So a lot of the weapons that are being used against our soldiers now, basically we could have kept out of harm's way had we, had we looked at it in, in the sense of looting. Uh, the second thing that General Abizad said that we should have learned is that uh, the debathification uh, program was too severe. Um, and that I think also is pretty well accepted. We were actually putting out of work uh, school teachers um, healthcare workers. Um, when in Saddam Hussein's regime, uh, like in communist regimes, you had to join the party to get jobs. So that doesn't mean they were ideologically in tune or in sync with Saddam Hussein. Unlike the way we did it in Germany, when we did denazification, where we only put the leaders on trial, we didn't put the whole nation on trial. Now I want to just go through a few other operational lessons learned. I'm not going to dwell on them because what I want to do is finally get to the question on the board the way I had other operational lessons learned, reconstruction. When we came in, we were going to give the best pediatric children's hospital in, Iraq, in the world and build it in Iraq. We were going to build roads. We were going to do this big, flashy infrastructure stuff, when in fact what we should have been doing is, in Chris's name, with the hearts in mind, get down to what the people really need. Build a basic health care system rather than one showcase ho a hospital. Uh, create jobs. in in uh, post-conflict situation after post-conflict situation, the biggest operational danger are unemployed male youth. And in most of these societies, the demographics of these countries are that 40 to 50 percent of the country is about 18 years and less and younger. If you get these young men out of school in a conflict environment, no jobs, nothing to do, what are they going to do? They're going to turn violent. They'll become criminals or they'll be recruited 
in the name of Allah or the name of nationalism to become fighters. Get these youths off, off the streets. Uh, the fourth operational, uh, I think, mistake that we made and lessons learned for the future is the political sequencing. I remember this very well because uh, Grand Ayatollah al Sistani kept saying, we want elections, elections, elections. And situation after situation we learned, and UN officials have said this too, you don't create or hold elections in most cases unless you first establish the rule of law. You have to have the rules of the game accepted, which means you write a constitution, you have the courts working, you have developed your police, you start delivering some social, social services. So police, so when, when you have the, the election, people are not just voting out of their fears. They're not just voting out of their ethnic affiliations because they're of uncertainty. They're voting on issues. And they have some sense of confidence that the state's gonna work. But when they say the center is, is collapsing, where are they gonna go for safety? They're gonna go to the persons who can provide it, whoever they may be. So the political sequencing is very, very important. And just to come in and hold elections at any point in time often legitimizes warlords, ethnic nationalists, and criminals. Fifth, we did not crack down on militias when we could have. We let them grow. There were no militias in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. None. He wouldn't allow it. He had his own private security, uh, which bypass the normal armed forces. But there weren't these independents going around, these 13 different actors that Tom referred to. The US ambassador to Iraq gave a talk the other day, and he said, as he sees it, there are four different wars going on in Iraq at the same time. There is the Al-Qaeda-led, foreign-led attacks. There is the Sunni insurgency, which sometimes cooperates it, with it, but has its own agenda. There is the now dominating sectarian conflict, Shia versus Sunni. And then there are intra-ethnic conflicts, particularly within the Shia themselves. And then, of course, you have all the criminal elements that are exploiting all that. So who is the enemy? How do you get your hand around it? At what level do you fight? And we let all that happen. We had the ability to stop it from the early beginnings. Now, every political party has its own militia. And it's, 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 it's very hard to count who they are. There are two big ones, uh, both of them are Shia, and then you have the Sunni insurgency. But you've got death squads operating now. The, the, um, the analysts are saying that even um, the Sada, uh, Maktada al-Sada is losing control over his militia. And so they're splitting and they're going off on their own. So it's a big entrepreneurial. So you have these gangsters and mafias that are going around. And it's not just a law enforcement problem, it's, 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 the, it's what happens when a state collapses. And you get uh, private militias uh, separating neighborhoods and adding to the sectarian conflict. Uh, sixth, and I alluded to this before, you have to have the rule of law uh, implemented from the beginning. It's the next step after you create a safe and secure environment. And in doing the rule of law, that means things like setting up commissions or some processes where you bring in the local people to start debating what kind of state they want to live in. Constitutional debates and make it a, a national dialogue. You start setting up courts. You start bringing in judges. Even if there aren't enough judges there, you bring them in and set up courts. You stand, set up a land commission to talk about land disputes and property losses over previous regimes and these regimes for population movements. You start getting a rule of law so people can settle those disputes and group grievances can be settled in ways other than the gun. Now, those were some of the operational lessons learned, I think. Strategically, I just want to point to two things. Um, looking at, again, the, the wide-angle lens on this, I think the biggest lesson that we take away from Iraq, and maybe even Afghanistan, is that we need to have a national dialogue in this country on the use and purpose of American power. The irony is, here we are, we are still, in traditional power terms, the most powerful country in the world. Our defense budget is 14, is, is, is it 14 times bigger uh, than all the other countries put together. Our economy is still a wonder. 
even though we have dips and valleys, but it's still the most dynamic economy in the world. Our culture is loved around the world. Young people, even in Iran, love American music, American movies, uh, sports. Uh, we're leaders on things like that, soft power and hard power. And yet, the irony is, we have all this power and we have so little influence. What does that mean? It means we're not using our power in the right way. And we have to decide, do we want to deal with countries? Surely there's an agreement in this country about we use our power for self-defense. If there really were uh, weapons of mass destruction, I think there would not have been the controversy over going into Iraq. But beyond self-defense, do we go in to Darfur? Uh, who do we work for or with in situations like Bosnia? What do we do about Haiti? Um, should we put more emphasis on soft power than hard power? We don't have really a debate about the use and purpose of American power, which is basically another way of saying what kind of leadership do we want to exercise in the world? And I think the second big lesson, and this is something, a theme that we stress a lot, is that the real soft underbelly of security in the post-war world uh, really resides in weak and failing states, even more than terrorism. Terrorism is a result of the inability of other states to serve the needs of their people and to be competent. And so they're hijacked by these other groups, as Afghanistan was hijacked by al-Qaeda. And what do we do? We go in, we overthrow the Taliban, and then basically, we don't do state building or nation building. Five years later, the Taliban is resurgent. We don't have the staying power. We don't have the attention. This is a generic threat. We need to do better in helping the rest of the world do better for themselves. So where does this lead us in Iraq? Well, we've been kind of ahead of the game and usually come out with very unpopular uh, recommendations which tend to be more acceptable down the road when people find other uh, uh, alternatives are not quite doing the trick. And so uh, even though I am in most cases against this option, I think it's an option that needs to be considered in the case of Iraq. And that is the case of uh, what I call the managed partition. And what we are advocating here and, uh, is, is basically a breakup of Iraq into the three provinces. This, that's the way Iraq was ruled under the Ottoman Empire, um, but in a, with a twist. And the twist is that we would keep the best of Iraq together, uh, the economy. So the model is a European Union style union in Iraq. We could create something, not we, but we, we, we generate the idea and discussion of a union of Iraqi states, each one of which would be independent, get a seat in the UN. Uh, they wouldn't be killing each other because they refuse to be ruled by the other ethnic group. But they would have a common currency. They would have a common central bank. You would have freedom of movement. The international community, if, it, if this is something the Iraqis could accept, could come in and the, our role then would change from one of occupation to one of state building. We could use our hard power to help each of these states protect their borders, to help each of these states train their own security forces where they wouldn't then be that tension between Shia and Sunni. The Kurds were already virtually self-sufficient. And the Shia just ran through parliament a new measure which says in 18 months, uh, we will start implementing what they call the, the Shia state or the super state in the south. But what about the Sunnis? Would they accept this? Well, not unless there was also an agreement for sharing the revenues from oil. And if you could have an oil revenue sharing formula in which, for example, one third would go to each of the three provinces, uh, one third would go to the provinces based on origin, uh, derivation they call it, where the oil comes from, which would give the Sunni and the Kurds a little bit of an edge, and one third to the population, by population and need. Then the Sunnis would be guaranteed an income. And if they're unwilling to accept their status in a bigger act, they may find very attractive the prospect of having their own self-rule in their own country. Often this kind of uh, uh, proposal is rejected out of hand because people say it will create carnage like India and Pakistan. But uh, I think that 
is now refuted by more recent examples like in Bosnia and the Sudan. Well, I'll stop there and just leave it open to a Q&A, but um, at least there's a plan on the table. Thank you, Dr. Baker. I have a question for each of you. And if you prefer not to answer the question, you want to address each other remarks, that's okay too. Um, first, Colonel Greenwood, <clears throat> if, if we're to follow, or if one were to follow the public pronouncements of our military um, and civilian leaders from a few months after major combat operations ended until the present, uh, including General Abizade's um, testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee. The key issue has been the need to increase the number of effective Iraqi security forces, and you mentioned that yourself. Yet three years later, since the end of major combat operations, we hardly appear any closer to the goal <clears throat> of standing up an effective Iraqi army and security apparatus. Um, so this is a little bit specific, but you know, you were overseeing some advisors who were training the Iraqi military. So the question is, what lessons have we learned or not learned from this experience? What is the real crux of the problem as to why these security forces do not exist when we all agree that they, they, they have to exist in order to provide the security, security, security mandate that you talked about? Uh, Colonel Holshek. Have our national leaders, have our military leaders, learned that soft power matters? After the Clinton era of foreign policy, I'm sure many of you will remember this, the Bush team campaigned on a rejection, essentially, of the need for soft power. And frankly, from my reading of it, the military breathed a happy sigh of relief and then we went into Iraq, and of course, we're now talking about soft power again. So the question is, have we gotten it? In particular, does the military itself think of itself as having a role in this soft power um, distribution, I guess? Or is it combat or bust? Are we learning that lesson in the military? Or what is the lesson we're learning or not learning? <clears throat> Dr. Baker, I was all set with my question until you threw that last one out. <laughs> uh, I'll let the audience talk to you about that one. Um, we had CENTCOM, Central Command. We had State, USAID. We had a specific ad hoc Defense Department group. We had the CIA. Everyone, everyone was looking at Iraq with some very clear pressure to examine conditions for conflict, yes, admittedly, this is the focus, but also, to some extent, post-conflict preparation. So forget the politics of, of the Bush administration for a minute. Does our bureaucracy, do our foreign policy professionals, do they have the know-how, do they have the structure in place, in your opinion, to take advantage of this uh, need for soft power, in your opinion. Colonel Greenwood? Building an army in our country takes a long time. And for those of you that can remember at the end of the Vietnam War, we had a draft in this country. And when we came out of the Vietnam War, our military was not in good shape. I mean, it was tired and it was broke from 10 years of Vietnam War. And, you know, we know from historians and some of us lived through it that it was plagued with racial problems and drug problems and lots of problems, including, you know, old and worn out equipment, so forth and so on. And, and so we decided as a nation to have go from a draft to an all volunteer force. We left Vietnam in 1975. And it took us from 1975 until 1990, really, to build and validate the all-volunteer army that we as Americans are able to enjoy. And that's in a, a modern technological country, 
uh, most powerful country. So when we look at a failed state or collapsed state that we should have recognized before we went in and we didn't, like Iraq, whose army dissolved on our march up to Baghdad, um, we need to keep that in mind. And I'm not an apologist, I'm not making an, a, an apology for the Iraqi security forces, but we have to be objective and dispassionate when we look at where Iraq's army should be. In fact, they had a, a, an okay army under Saddam. And I say okay because it was, it was largely a jobs program under Saddam and it was a way for him to keep angry young men off the streets. Um, he had a few elite units, but for the most part, it was, a, it was a very conscript kind of army, poorly trained. But at any rate, it disappeared when we took Baghdad. And so we had to, with the Iraqi government, start the process of rebuilding that army and the police forces too. And so here we are three, three years later, and we have 10 Iraqi divisions that are out there, and they're formed and manned and equipped or somewhat equipped, and they're being trained. The Iraqi soldier is a courageous, brave, hardworking, loyal, dependable individual. So when you hear about problems with the Iraqi army, it's not at the soldier level. The, the Iraqi soldiers that I worked with and fought with were, were very, very dedicated, uh, as dedicated as any American soldier or Marine is to the cause. Uh, and their competence out in the field is not bad. Um, rather, rather, the challenge is administrating and sustaining that army from Baghdad, from their equivalent of the Pentagon. All those administrative resourcing things that you have to do to maintain and sustain an army administratively. Pay, promotions, equipment, logistics, uh, maintenance, um, leadership because all of the officers that were in the Iraqi army under Saddam Hussein, uh, who had lots of experience, some corrupt for sure, uh, some you know brutal and barbaric for sure, but all those guys went away, and, and now we have brand new officers who've never been officers before. In fact, some of them have never been in the army before. Here, you be a colonel today, okay? Oh, next week we'll send you through training, okay? So, the problem there is, is, is not the quality of the Iraqi soldier. The, the problem with building up this ISF is getting the government of Baghdad to understand it's creating an all-volunteer force. And if you don't pay soldiers, if you don't pay the police, they're going to go work for the insurgents because al-Qaeda will pay them. You know, we, uh, Chris mentioned here just a minute ago, Lebanon, one of the great lessons coming out of Lebanon is how rapidly Hezbollah is, the, the day the war ended, okay, you had reconstruction teams out there rebuilding the citizens' homes. Hezbollah was in there doing social programs, okay, building up the clinics, the schools, and doing all those things uh, that, you're, that they understand it, they get it, okay. But uh, the Iraqi government Okay, because of you know 20 some years of dictatorship under Saddam Hussein, where taking the initiative got you in front of a firing squad. Okay, now we have those people running the Baghdad ministries. And one of the things I had to do when I was over there was try to get a police force set up in Al Anbar. And once a month I would go to Baghdad and I'd sit in the Ministry of Interior with very high level Iraqi officials and try to explain to them why they have to make payroll if they want to keep police on the street. And it was very frustrating uh, because some of them didn't understand it just because they were incompetent, but more understood it and more understood because they were Shia and they didn't really want the Sunni police to thrive and be capable in Baghdad, that by denying me money that I could then take back there and pay to the Iraqi policemen, they were undercutting, undercutting our, our campaign objectives. So anyways, uh, that's, I don't want to talk any more on this question because there's a lot more to talk about here tonight, but that sort of gives you the flavor of the magnitude of the challenges that we face there. Um, 
those 10 divisions, many of them are, are in the fight right now. Um, you know, but the problem is half the Iraqi army is gone at any one time. Half of the Iraqi army every day is on leave because they're taking their paychecks home to their families because there's no banking system in Iraq. There's no automatic teller. There's no direct deposit. So if I want my family down in Basra to eat, I have to take my money and drive and hitchhike or catch a bus 200 miles away so I can feed my family. Thank you. Well, as I alluded to in my short remarks, uh, we are getting better at this, this business of, of national security and counterinsurgency warfare and applying soft power. And it's a learning process. What we're trying to do, maybe we don't realize it uh, across the board, but what we're trying to do is essentially change our strategic culture. And that takes a long time. I mean, the strategic culture, as I said, that we have um, has largely been you know, founded since the Civil War. Um, so don't expect anybody, you know, don't anybody expect overnight for us to, you know, change this that quickly. Uh, I, you know, I talked about certain things such as, uh, you know, if you read the national security strategy, uh, the majority of the aims or objectives of our national security strategy actually are soft power intensive. Uh, some are mixed. There's only one, actually, that talks about hard power. Uh, of the 28-odd recommendations of the uh, Commission on 9-11, most of them are soft power intensive. Uh, one or two talk about hard power. So, you know, in the kind of hierarchy that we have learned at the War College about ends, ways, and means, ways being the concepts and, and so on, means being the resources. Uh, you know, in the ends part of it, we're, we've really made quite a bit of progress, it's, there's a, but there's a kind of a trickle-down effect that, that has to occur. And I don't think it's quite gotten down there yet. So, and, and, I, and I think, in fact, and I'm going to make a connection here uh, to last week's elections. I think the, one of the key actors in all, of, in all of this in changing our strategic culture is the Congress. Why? Because they control the purse strings. They're the ones who are going to say, okay, do we continue to have a national security structure or an interagency structure that has the Defense Department on steroids and everybody else on life support? <laughs> you know, when, when it, in my line of work in civil affairs, uh, you know, we're only about 6,500 odd people. Now that sounds like a lot of folks, uh, but we are by far the bu one of the busiest specialties in the military, and 90% of us are reserves, for good reasons. Um, we are about transition to peace. We are about leveraging soft power through the interagency process and the private sector, increasingly through the private sector, and I'm not talking just about Halliburton. Uh, I'm talking about Fortune 500 companies. Applied preventatively, which we're seeing now in places like Africa, and one of the other major lessons, as Pauline's pointed out, is it's better. But by the way, it's a whole lot cheaper to prevent a state from failing than to go fix it after it's failed. Whole lot cheaper. And we're starting to do that in places like Africa. So there's a learning, there is a learning curve here. Um, But, you know, here we are in a university. How do, you how do you create a learning organization or how do you change the organizational culture? A lot of that's through training and education. A lot of that's going to be through the incentives that you give for leadership. One of the things that we did, you know, 20 odd years ago with Goldwater Nichols to create more jointness uh, in the military is to basically mandate that if you were going to be a general officer, you had to have a joint assignment. So you thought joint because you worked it. Same thing with the interagency. Same thing maybe with soft power. Some of our higher level people uh, that, that as prerequisites to their getting to that level, maybe that's, those are the kinds of things um, we ought to think about. It. And some folks have talked about a gold, water, nickels for the, for the interagency. Maybe, it, you know, that's a good idea. Um, 
the the military among you know I I've seen a remarkable evolution if you will among the military commanders that I've worked with and they you know this whole business about you know a lot of a lot of military commanders in an earlier time you know and you know we're always dealing with inertia here you know people don't like change if they don't understand it so we tend to kind of go back to our comfort zones well comfort zones for a lot of military commanders has been hey I just want to go out and kill people that's what I've been designed to do I've been trained for some, so many odd years to, you know, 5,000 Soviet tanks across the border. Where's the enemy? Find them, fix them, destroy them. Thank you very much. I'm going home. Uh, it's war. It, it, it really, it, it, the essence of war has not changed. It, it's just that we have focused on only certain parts of it. You know, that, that, that famous dictum that, about Clausewitz, the, that war is an extension of policy by other means. Well, but what... Clausewitz is implying when he says that, that that war is one of a number of means by which we implement policy. Um, and so po it's all between, the, if you will, the extremes of war and peace and what the, the military likes to call in joint terms the full range of operations or the army calls the full spectrum of operations. The kinds of warriors and military leaders that we have nowadays have to be these, uh, at, at this new term the Army's got called these pentathlete warriors, guys who can be diplomats with the turn of a switch and warriors at the next. And that is a tall order, folks. That's a real tall order. And I, I challenge anybody to be able to do that. With, you, know, with, you know, I've got 26 years in the, in the military, and, and I only think this way because I've been doing it for 20-odd years, the civil affairs business. But as I said, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first got into the business, you know, a lot of, mil a lot of the, the real warrior, you know, types in the military thought that, you know, guys who, who actively wanted to go do this civil affairs stuff, which was kind of like being in an NGO, must have been like closet homosexuals or something. Why don't they, don't they just want to go out and kill people? Because we understand, and, and they now understand, that if we are able to, to leverage other elements of military, of, of, excuse me, other elements of national power than just military or hard power, you're saving blood and treasure. And particularly if you apply it preventatively before the, the state fails or collapses. Uh, and that's not, that's not being, uh, you know, a tree hugger or something. That's being smart. And a lot of commanders I deal with now are a hell of a lot smarter in those respects than they were before. Um, we had to kind of go through the steep learning curve once again about counterinsurgency warfare because, as, as I said in the Tom Ricks book, uh, we had a kind of institutional amnesia about counterinsurgency warfare once, you know, Vietnam was over with. Um, but, you know, the military is a remarkable learning organization. We tend to think it isn't because, you know, we think about hierarchy and discipline and all those things. But it, it, it is a remarkable learning organization. And, and, I, and in fact, I think, as I, in the paper that I gave you a copy of and anybody's welcome to have, um, I, I point out that DOD, in, in essence, is going to have to lead a lot of this change because they have the wherewithal to do it. Uh, they are, in many respects, uh, better structured to be a learning organization than m much of the rest of the interagency. And that, in, in fact, is, is the essence of, of civil military operations. It's enabling those other elements of power, those other organizations, those civilians to get in on the game and do the nation building things that they really ought to be doing so that we don't have to have soldiers do it. There's a paradox in that relationship. And many people I see are beginning to get it. It just takes a little bit of time. What I exhort you all to do, since you've now just elected a new Congress, is to make sure that your new members of Congress, or maybe the guys that you reelected, understand this, because they're the guys who write the checks for the programs that support this. Um, and, you know, again, national security is something that doesn't just happen over there. That's a big, that's something we haven't fully absorbed as a nation yet. You know, we have to pay more attention to what's going on outside in the world. We can't just worry about Britney Spears 
you know, and, and you know, who's on uh, uh, lost next weekend or, 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 you know, how well did the Packers do? Um, or even gas prices. We really have to have a more global view because it, what's going on out there beyond our shores is having greater impact on our lives than we realize. We may not, even in Wisconsin, think that it's happening, but it is. And for those of us who've been out there, uh, we know it, and and these things are not as far away as you think they are. Uh, well, Chris more or less answered the question, but I'll be brief and just add my two cents to it. Um, Tom talked about how hard it is to change an army and how long it took for us to shift to an all-volunteer army. Uh, and the army changes faster than a bureaucracy because they've got the discipline and the structure to do it. So creating a change in the bureaucracy and in a sense that they have to work jointly for this sort of thing and get this new soft power integrated into hard power approach is going to be a monumental job. However, I don't think that it's a problem of money only. I remember hearing a um, presentation by the Secretary of the Army about the new approach and the new strategy for this now core mission in doing peace and stability operations or reconstruction and stability operations has now been adopted as a core mission of the U.S. Army, which it never used to be before. There's also been other directives that have been issued by the President and, and other transformational diplomacy, exhortations from the Secretary of State, and a new bureau in the State Department called um, the Office of uh, the Coordinator for Stability and Reconstruction. Uh, all this is going on, but I think what it comes down to is how the military decides this is going to be done. And one, one reason is what Chris said is because they get all the resources. And the military is held in very high esteem in this country. Uh, our economy is tightly linked to the military. We do multi-year planning for all of the weaponry that we do. So the budget, the military budget, is the 800-pound gorilla in this question. And uh, so they have the resources, but the mindset. Now, they can change quickly, but they have to change. And when this Secretary of the Army was giving this um, presentation, and he talked about the full spectrum of conflict and how they're going to do it all, somebody asked the question, well, I thought the State Department was supposed to have a role in these or even take the lead. He says, yeah, they take the lead, but we actually do everything. Why is that? Well, because when we tell a soldier to go to Iraq, he goes to Iraq. He has no way to turn down the assignment. If the State Department wants an officer to go to Iraq, they have the option of turning down the assignment. So we end up doing the job. Now that was the attitude, not the policy. That was the attitude. Rather than saying, well, we end up doing the job most of the time, and by God, we're not going to let that happen anymore, so we have to bring in these other agencies and get a whole of government approach and so forth. They are moving in different ways. We are actually in a project now uh, in partnership with other organizations to do a whole of government system of measures and metrics for these operations with a computerized program and different indicators that are coming in. So they're beginning to learn that they want these tools. But to have it done in such a way so that when you have a crisis or you're looking ahead and you're doing the strategic analysis, that you have a proactive approach. And it's going to be a long time before that happens. Can I, can I follow up on what Pauline said? Because I think it's very important. Uh, I would be the last person to say that uh, any of the services have it right, but uh, my service to Marines, we, we have a long tradition of, of involve our, uh, involvement in what we call the small wars, and uh, uh, most of it not by choice. But uh, uh, Pauline mentioned the attitude, and, and I think that's really important because I think, I think the sons and daughters of America that are out there in uniform that get put on these operations, they get it before the people in Washington get it. Um, I've missed all the big wars in, our, in the last 30 years. I, I go to all little small dirty wars. And um, I was in Haiti in 1994 as part of the landing at a place called Cape Haitian. And uh, I don't know, a, a city of maybe uh, uh, 50,000 or so. No, no electricity, no water. Garbage had not been picked up in the streets for over a year. It was, it was a failed city. And, uh, you know, the young Marines and, and sailors that landed there, 
I mean, nobody told us, gave us an order to do this stuff. But we instinctively knew to win the good, the hearts and minds of the local people, we had to get the electricity working, we had to get the water running, and within 24 hours, Marines were out there picking up garbage, and you know, we had that city moving pretty quick. And it was, it was a very uh, rewarding thing to see. And so I think there is a, a bias for action on the part of the young American men and women in uniform. We just got to get the policy right at the higher level. And, and then I'll, 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 and I'll be quiet after this next comment. I had, uh, fast forward, I had the opportunity to do tsunami relief in Indonesia. And I, I happened to be the senior Marine uh, military commander on the ground there. And everybody said, it's going to be a failure. This is the largest Muslim nation on, on earth, and they, they hate Americans, and it's going to be a terrible experience. And that's not at all what we found. And uh, we found that the Indonesians were very friendly and appreciative of, of what we did there. And again, this attitude, because I, I, we were there for about three weeks, and we had to get on a ship and sail over into the Persian Gulf. But young Marines coming up and saying, sir, why do we have to leave? We want to stay here and finish the job. There's more work to be done. You know, three weeks, we still have more work to be done. So I think there's a bright future. I just want to add a footnote in terms of who gets it and who doesn't. Not only do the soldiers on the ground get it, but some of the people who we define as spoilers or opponents of U.S. policy get it too. And just as an example, Maktada Osada, when he was uh, part of the government and uh, still is, and they were doling out cabinet posts. Everybody else was going and jockeying to get the security positions, not him. He got the health ministry. Why? Because he wants to deliver social goods to get popular support. And he's also using the health ministry for a lot of other nefarious activities. But he saw the capability of getting a public service cabinet post so that he would have the ability to make a direct impact on the people. He already had his own army, so he didn't need to take over the, the, uh, the Iraqi army. You know, and just to, one last thing to kind of caps some of the remarks here um, about getting it. You know, the, the, the issue here is, okay, the good news is that we're, we are getting it better. That's the good news. But are we getting it better fast enough and thoroughly enough? And are we doing the service that we need to be doing and structuring our young men and women out there um, in the service, not just of the military, but in the service of peace in many other respects? Are we doing that? Uh, are we doing that quickly enough to stay ahead of our asymmetric adversaries? Uh, I'm not so sure. And I'll, I'll be, again, I'll come back to, to, you know, the American public needs to get it and they need to exhort their, their elected officials to damn well get it. Because the faster that they get it and the faster that those folks in Washington get it, uh, I think the more blood and treasure that we ultimately save. Thank you. Um, are there some questions from the audience? Uh, <clears throat> First off, I'd like to thank uh, the panel at UWMC for this forum. It was uh, very informative and enjoyable. I did my graduate work concentrating on the events leading up to the Cold War and the foreign policy diplomacy involved and its failures. I think the lesson that should be learned from Iraq is our own political system is tragically flawed. A democracy is dependent on an informed and involved citizenry. And leading up to the war, the media failed miserably. The New York Times and Washington Post later admitted it. The idea that a huge percentage of Americans believed Iraq was behind the events of September 11th showed the ignorance of the American public. To go along with our ignorance is our arrogance. As Governor Bush said in 2000 when running for president, if we go into a country and tell them they should do it our way, this way, because that's the way we do it, they will find us arrogant and oppose us. <laughs> our war in Iraq was a war of choice and a terrible mistake. My question to the panel is, 
Does the current political process in America doom us to repeated foreign policy blunders? My fear is it does. Well, I'll start on a high note and say I think the results of this election showed that there's still some hope in the American political system. I agree with everything you said. Um, I wouldn't be as harsh on the American people, though, because the argument made for WMD was based on intelligence. And I myself remember thinking I was against the war, but I said, what if they're right? Maybe they have intelligence that's there, that there is WMD there. I didn't know. I didn't have access to that intelligence. And neither did the American public. So the real, I think, responsibility is on the shoulders of the people who told us that. Now, the American people are very patriotic. They support a president in time of crisis. They certainly want to support our troops that are out in the field. I think that the American political system has, has in it the capacity to stop more mistakes if the American public and electorate stays alert and active and comes out and exercises their rights, just like uh, Chris was saying, and hold leaders accountable when they make horrendous mistakes like this. Um, and I think Congress is to blame as well. They didn't hold hearings. I remember the hearings on Vietnam, Fulbright hearings. You know, they were informing the American public of an alternative point of view. This Congress did not do it. So I would hold the leaders responsible and not so much the American public, but except in the fact that I don't think that they were vigilant enough. I certainly agree with you with the press. I would even indict the press more because I don't think they cover international affairs, period. You know, unless, it, unless Americans are dying. Um, it didn't used to be that way. It's hard when I'm traveling outside the East Coast or San Francisco or whatever. Really, you've, the news is there in an age of global information, but you've got to go get it. It's not in your daily newspaper. And I think that's, that's a real disservice, and that then gets into another debate over uh, newspapers becoming a business and not having the sort of Edward R. Murrow mission of educating the public. So maybe there's something more that the public can do in terms of, uh, 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 you know, uh, its circulation. But now you can get news on the internet, and our young people I'm, I'm very worried about because most of their news comes from the internet or John Stewart or, you know, not really reading a whole article uh, unless, you know, they're self-selecting involved in international affairs. But the average American college student, I don't think, reads the newspapers on a daily basis. And if they do, they don't have access to all the newspapers that cover international events. So I think we are woefully... Uh, I think Tom put it naive. I would go further and say woefully ignorant or innocent, if you want to put it that way, of what's going on in the rest of the world. We were just talking earlier about the value of living abroad to such an extent that you actually see the world through that local culture, another local culture. You never, ever lose that experience. It's like learning how to swim. Once you learn, you learn. And I always am thinking, gee, how would they see it? How would they see it? And you get this instinct of saying, oh my God, what an awful thing to say because I know how that's going to go down somewhere else. And we just don't have that sensitivity. And we've got to demand more of our press. We've got to demand more of our leaders in terms of answering to the American people. And if they don't explain sufficiently what's going on and why, we shouldn't accept it and make our voices heard. We did in this election. I hope it doesn't have to happen only when we reach a crisis of this proportion, I, because I, then we will repeat the mistake. I, I have a different, I don't disagree. In fact, I, I agree with uh, much of what's been said. I think I just have a slightly different perspective of somebody that's spent most of my adult life either in, in foreign countries or getting ready to go to foreign countries or having just returned from foreign countries. Um, I think we have a marvelous political system here because as I've traveled around the world, I've seen very few other countries, as flawed as our media may be, that are as open, have, have an open, have the same kind of open press that we have. And, uh, you know, most of the world was shocked that we had a Watergate. They, they were shocked that, that we thought it was an issue because uh, that kind of thing goes on as a matter of course in a lot of places around the world. And, um, yes, it's not, it's not a perfect system. And democracies, you can fail in democracies as, as easily as you can in any other form of government, probably. But, but uh, 
you think of all the, the great things that, you know, our political system has accomplished over the last 50 years and the challenges that we've had to surmount. And I'm a pretty uh, ardent supporter of it. Uh, and, you know, we're living through history right now with this election. That's the magnificence of our system is that one man, one vote, one man, one woman, one vote, and the people get to speak every uh, two or four and six years. And uh, I think it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous thing. You know, Winston Churchill once said that Americans will always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other alternatives. <laughs> Now, and, and I think that, you know, we see this over and over again in our history. Um, I think the genius of our system, and, and, I, and I don't disagree with what you said, I, I, and I, I, I applaud that kind of, of uh, vigilance, if you will, and, and, and healthy self-doubt uh, that we have at times in our system. But I think the genius of our system our, the, that our founding fathers set up is they had a very profound understanding of human nature. Uh, and both the good and the bad parts of it. Um, and that's why we have checks and balances and, and the system that we have. And it, it, if you're trying to be the chairman of the board of planetary management, as we've been somehow thrusted into, perhaps willingly or unwillingly, uh, it's not a very efficient system for decision making in that role, okay? Let's understand that, that there are pluses and minuses to that. I don't know if I would want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this is a football town. I mean, you know, you got to go back to what Lombardi talks about, you know, the basics, blocking and tackling. Football teams that get into a lot of trouble get so wrapped up in the 150 different plays that they've got on their playbook and forget the basics. And uh, sometimes we gotta do that too. Sometimes we gotta sit back and, and as Pauline has, has talked about and, and look, at, look back, you know, maybe at that old civics class that we had and say, you know, what are we about? Because that, those things are the inherent strengths of our country that nobody really can take away from us and compete with us. Uh, and that it's not just about soft power versus hard power. It's about what we are about. And, and if we have remain kind of cognizant of that, then I think we will always somehow, even though we may rumble and bumble and stumble towards that objective, do the right thing because we have an innate sense of what that is, even though we may not be able to articulate it at the moment. Oh, sorry, over here. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot actually see your name, uh, Colonel, to the closest to Professor Giordano. Holshek, Colonel Holshek. Bad eyesight, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I guess I have a question. You had referred to uh, the United States getting better at um, preventing uh, states from failing in Africa. Um, I guess maybe I might not have heard you correctly. I guess for my own educational purposes, if you could explain a situation where that happened. And also for all three of you, um, do you think that now that Mr. Rumsfeld is no longer the... <laughs> you like that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no longer the defense secretary. Do you think that the hard power, soft power situation will change? Okay. Um, I am the chief operations officer of a civil affairs brigade that is headquartered in Philadelphia. And we are the civil affairs brigade that sends, and we're a reserve brigade. We are, th there's a very fine uh, civil affairs battalion here in Wisconsin, by the way, the 432nd. I've served, served side by side with them in Iraq, a great bunch of folks. Um, we are the civil affairs brigade and our 
battalions that are sending teams out about once every month or two to do what they call nation assistance missions uh, throughout Trans-Saharan Africa under a, pro under a program called Operation Enduring Freedom Trans-Sahara. Yes, we are actually fighting a war in Africa. Um, but the idea, and you know, again, this is a, you know, the Americans always do the right thing. We're catching on to the idea of, gee, wouldn't it be better to go in and try to prevent states from failing than to wait till they fail? And then, you know, and, and it's even in the national security strategy. The greatest threat to our national security strategy is this specter of failing states. Um, so we've got all kinds of programs under what they call a theater engagement strategy, which is part of Africa, or at least right now, as part of the European command, or a good part of it is under the European command. And under the European command theater strategy, and it's been, being done in South, uh, Southcom to some extent, but, but also very much in PACOM in, in Asia, where we're going out and doing these nation assistance missions, which are largely interagency activities, not just the military, um, to help state building um, to teach militaries, for example, how to be militaries in democratic societies and understanding the importance of the you know, civil authority over the military and things like that. Um, their responsibility to their citizenry, which is what a lot of the civil affairs people tend to do. Um, so we're doing those kinds of things now and it's it's all very much in its very nation uh, period, but I think that that's something that we have picked up from Iraq and Afghanistan is this idea of sort of preventative, under the rubric perhaps of preventative diplomacy. Um, and, and again, we work very closely with the State Department on these things. So, so things are afoot in that respect. Uh, and I'll turn the rest of the answer now over to, well, okay, the, the, the Rumsfeld thing. I'll, okay, I didn't, I, I, okay, I, I'm not going to escape from that. Um, you know, it's not just about soft versus hard power, um, it, but it's, it's about, again, understanding what national security really is. And, you know, the, 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 the thing that I guess, I don't want to get to too many comments about the Secretary of Defense, but, or the former Secretary of Defense, but you know, the, the thing is, it still is actually, um, um, but you know, it goes back to what Tom and I were pointing out earlier about understanding the kind of war, the kind of strategic or operational environment that you're in. Um, and you know, there, there were obviously some lapses there on, on his part. Um, and some of that is due to, you know, the tendency, again, human nature being what it is. We like to look at the world through our, the prism that we have, through our belief systems that we have. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just that we, as Tom very well pointed out, you know, we may find out that the war that we thought we were involved in in 2003 is not the same as the one we're involved in in 2006. Things change. After all, think about this. You know, even Abe Lincoln, back in, in the 1860s, he started off by saying that the purpose of, of, of the Civil War, the, the objective of, the, of his administration in the Civil War was to preserve the Union. And then in 1863, he gave this little speech and talked about slavery and freeing people. And he changed the objectives of the war in the middle of the war. So this is not something that, that you know, has, has only happened in Iraq. Um, it's happened in, in previous wars. Um, but again, it, before you do that, you've got to understand what, you know, as Vince Lombardi would say, is what the hell is going on here? And uh, that's really the point of the game. And, you know, for, for better or for worse, um, you know, the secretary got some of it and maybe he didn't get some other parts of it. I, I, I think the issue was really more with his personal style of leadership than it was with, with the way he saw the world or what he thought was right um, then. And I'll, and I'll shut up now because I don't want to get myself in too much trouble. <laughs> we're, we're uh, I think, sometimes too euphoric about changes of personalities. Uh, there was a guy named uh, McNamara back during the Vietnam War and, and, and when he resigned, there was a similar kind of euphoria, and, 
and, and I don't I can't remember how many more years after McNamara resigned you know the war was still going on and and um, and I remember when you know Nixon resigned after Watergate and there was great euphoria over that and that lasted a day and then it was back to you know the same old problems so I I'm not uh, personally uh, uh, you know civil public servants all of us who work for the government whether in uniform or out we're public servants we work at the behest of the American people you're our bosses and we come and go and somebody comes and replaces us I think that um, the challenge that we face now is to recover the moral authority that we had as a country in the eyes of the world. And part of the reason we lost that moral authority, I think, was the way we behaved. Not only the content of our decisions, but the way we behaved. Dating back to attitude, tone, what are we about? And I think that Secretary Rumsfeld embodied that tone. I think his stepping down would help people embrace larger ideas because if he was known to be a person who is very bright but very stubborn about his own way of seeing things. And I hope he listens more to his own military commanders now, uh, the new secretary. Um, because I know there was a great deal of frustration within the military over the fact that um, uh, he did not listen to them. Many of the books about how we got into Iraq talk about, uh, for example, that first lesson learned that I referred to, not enough troops. Um, Cobra II in particular was talking about every time his commanders came up with a plan, he said, cut, 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 again and again and again. Very good example of not listening. Um, and because he had another agenda, which was to get that civilian control over the military. So I wouldn't put too much stock in the removal of just one person, because what we're talking about here, all of us on this panel, is a much larger job that we have ahead of us. But it's a step toward the accountability, I think, that we all felt that needed to be uh, uh, shown in, in the administration. And I hope it has short-term, but even more long-term uh, help and, and sets a new tone, a new pace for reestablishing the moral authority. I, I would say the other thing, and I know this is controversial, but I think another reason we lost moral authority, and this is one of the reasons that the United States didn't come out as high as it did on our failed state index on terms of risk, uh, was, the, was uh, the, the fact that we came down a lot uh, on human rights. Uh, and you know we were the champion of human rights in the world. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was the champion of it. We insisted on the rule of law, whatever we did, but we ourselves are not uh, as good as we could be and should be on the rule of law. Um, and the whole torture debate, the rendition, it's done us terrible damage in the eyes of the world, um, as well as I think in, a, in, the, in our own society. That's what I mean by the moral authority. What do we stand for? We don't even know what we stand for anymore because we're so divided much less the rest of the world knowing what we stood for. But we used to stand for human rights. And uh, I don't think the rest of the world sees us as, as an upholder of human rights the way, the way we used to be. Now, a lot of people say that's the price of fighting terrorism. Well, maybe it is. And if you believe it is, then you better well recognize that you're also losing something and there's a trade-off. And that will be we will lose our moral standing in the world. And that's one of the reasons why we have all this power but very little influence understand the war that you're in. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I came here with the idea of asking about the partitioning of Iraq, but Dr. Baker addressed that a little bit. So let me throw out a follow-up question. Um, what are the political implications in the region from such a partitioning if it were to happen? Uh, the fears of a greater Kurdistan, for example, uh, Shia alignment with the uh, Iranians, and so forth. A very good question. Um, uh, again, coming back to the theme of understanding your environment, what's happening now in Iraq is the fragmentation of the country. There's ethnic cleansing going on. People are resettling in ethnically segregated neighborhoods. 
uh, and I pointed to other trends that were going on. Iran is already very deeply involved uh, in Iraq. Um, I don't think we would stop that involvement. I don't think we can stop that involvement. I think if we talk, I mean, I'm all in favor of talking to enemies, and I think we should do it. But clearly, at this stage of the game, I think Iran is in the catbird seat. And if we start talking to Iran, they're going to say, okay, uh, you want us to do X, Y, and Z. I want a free pass on our nuclear development. And we're not willing to pay that price. Same thing with Syria. If we go talk to Syria and they say they'll stop fueling the Sunni insurgency, they'll say, okay, you give us back the Golan Heights. We're not willing to pay that price. So we have to look at it more holistically. There isn't a silver bullet here. As a result, what I think that we're doing now, and I, I think that um, Iraq, unfortunately, is, is uh, past the point of no return in fragmentation, balkanization, Lebanization, however you want to uh, call it. And we're tied to it. And if we resist that tide, rather than try to manage it in a better way and face reality, then I think we can possibly have a soft landing where we have, we bring in the neighboring countries, not just Iran and, and Syria, but Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, uh, the whole region, to talk about a positive vision. There cannot be a military victory here, as, as Tom said. There is no military victory possible any longer. But there could be a viable peace that has the way of stopping the carnage, which is really fueling more terrorism and, f and, and more anti-Americanism, in a way that everybody gets a little piece of what they want, not everything that they want. And the international community plays a constructive role. Now, that doesn't get us off the hook in terms of whether we should have gone in or not. I think we're still going to be blamed. Now, when, when I talk about this, people come back with lots of things like you did. Will that be a bad thing? Um, Iran actually, I think, would like the disintegration of Iraq because they would end up being the predominant power in the region. They are already the predominant power in the region. Even if Iraq stays together, it will be so severely weakened and so absorbed with its own internal fighting that Iran will end up being the dominant power. So why don't we do it in a way where we're seen to be constructive and we can have a soft landing? As far as Kurdistan is concerned, I think you know, we are an ally of the Kurds and the Turks. And I think we could operate it as an honest broker and provide security guarantees to both, including shared intelligence, surveillance on the border, uh, um, a, um, a commission in which we serve to, to make sure there were no violations in terms of uh, Kurds' incursion into Turkey. There are a lot of things that we can do to quell the tension on that border. I think Turkey has very legitimate concerns about an independent Kurdistan. Um, and I think Kur the Kurds know it. But they are very grateful to us to giving them the freedom they have, and they're not going to settle for anything less than full autonomy. So we could play a constructive role. Another reason that it's been opposed, the ambassador actually said this, our ambassador to Iraq, that um, if we propose something like this, people would say, ah, this is what the United States wanted to do all along, is to dismember another Arab Muslim state. Well, I think that's a red herring because we're already suspicious of coming in for oil. We're already su accused of coming in to establish military bases. Whatever we do, we're going to be blamed for the outcome. So why don't we just push aside the blame game and just look at it cold and say, what is happening on the ground? President Bush keeps saying what we have to do has to accord with what's happening on the ground. He's right on that. But he's got to widen the lens. It's not just based on the security forces, which are already very difficult to train, as Tom said, but another problem is that the security forces themselves are driven by sectarianism. So are we training militias that are basically going to, you know, we're going to leave there someday, go at each other? Or can we train states to be responsible, to have responsible security forces? Um, we did it in the Balkans. It's not the ideal solution. But it's better than fighting the wars that they were fighting. And we're, do we're doing it in southern Sudan. Why not do it in Iraq? Here's how I would answer your question. Um, I think over the next month, between now and the President's State of the Union address, I think there's going to be continued debate in our country as to which way we're going to pivot, change direction with regard to our Iraq policy. And because of our great political process, that's going to be open. We're going to be able to read about it. 
and we're going to be able to influence it as citizens of, of our land uh, should we elect desire to do that. While, that. while that debate is going on, there's something else that I think we need to be very mindful of, and that is that this question is largely not going to be decided here in America. It's going to be largely decided in Baghdad by the newly democratically elected government of that country who has a constitution, however flawed, and has their own democratically elected government, however, however weak that may be. We tend to forget that sometimes as Americans. And there's a lot of plans out there, partitions one of them, as to what Iraq's future should look like. My friends in Baghdad, some of whom work in the green zone, who are privy to these kinds of issues, say that the Iraqi government right now is not too keen on the idea of partition. Why? Well, number one is there's not a lot of confidence on the part of the Shias that the Sunnis, even though they get their own little section of the country, are going to be contented with that section of the country and won't be raiding into everybody else's section to including attacking parts of oil fields that they feel they're not getting their fair share of. So there's a lack of confidence on the part of the Shias towards the Sunnis that, that they would even, the Sunnis would be contented with partition. There's the Kurdish issue that we just spoke about. But the real issue with Kurdistan is not Kurdistan itself in Iraq. It's the millions of Kurds that live inside Turkey that Turkey is really worried about. It's spawning successionist uh, movements within Turkey, and they start losing provinces of their country. So there's some real concerns there. And we, we know from pretty reliable sources that Turkey has on numerous occasions contemplating invading Kurdistan uh, because of this fear that Turkey itself would fragment. I could go on and on. I'm not here to, to, uh, to uh, defend or advocate for any of these options because I don't have the answer. But I, I would just say we should be very cautious over the next two months here that this is not going to be something that we decide as America and impose on the Maliki government. I, don't, I think. I think we're well past that. You know, I think Pauline, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. I think Pauline's idea that, that we've got to approach this within a regional context is, 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 is quite right. Um, I think in a sense what we need to do is kind of, re, you know, think of a bicycle pedal here. We've got to kind of remove ourselves from the equation as the antagonist and maybe in a very quiet way insert ourselves back into the equation as a protagonist. What I mean by that, one's pulling away the hard power and the other's a soft power. We need to get the Middle East process, peace process back on track. Our administration's ignored that for too long. We need a serious, serious national energy strategy because it's our biggest vulnerability out there. Um, and if you don't think that that's not connected to our, our exit strategy in Iraq, then I think you need to think, re reconsider that. Um, we have to look at this, again, broad, more broadly and holistically. We have to think of it in those terms. The kinds of things that we did in the Cold War, uh, you know, the U.S. Information Agency, the Voice of America, the, the educational exchanges. Does, does this university have a partner or, or a sister university in the Middle East? Or any kind of exchanges? There you go. Um, those kinds of things need to be done uh, across America. And again, it, it's not just the folks in Washington. Uh, we have to open up those societies. That, you know, one of the more interesting documents, folks, if you've never read it, is NSC 68. What is NSC 68? Well, NSC 68 basically talked about what containment is. NSC 68 was the closest thing we've had, and it was done in 1947, to some sort of a consensus document, whether you were Republican or Democrat, you agreed 90% with the str overall strategic objectives of containment strategy, whether it was the Truman Doctrine, Eisenhower Doctrine, Kennedy, they were all inflections of it. But that kind of thinking, and one of the interesting things about that document, you know what, that document's mostly about soft power. That document talks about the eroding power of freedom, to erode 
though those autocratic totalitarian states and their power um, and and maybe that's kind of the kind of idea we've got to come back to is again let's play our strengths here in this game and we've got a lot of them um, so we've frittered away some of that but maybe some of it we can regain ladies and gentlemen I'm sorry to say that our, our time is up um, but it has been a, a great privilege to <clears throat> hear from three experts. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this panel. Um, we're going to prevail upon our experts to join us for a brief reception in the terrace room, which, as I mentioned, if you go straight out the exit to the right, and maybe if you have some further questions, they'll indulge us. But we are so grateful for you coming, for the time you took, and the energy you took to get here, and we'd like to thank them very much. <laughs>